What is it about wax? Is it the sensual nature of candles? Yeah, give me that sandalwood. It's pliable nature. The desire to chew on it, perhaps. Ooh. Remember those red candy lips that nobody liked because they were just flavored paraffin wax and they tasted like shoes? Mmm, shoes. Mmm, wax. Fun for everyone. Wax. Or is it? Today I'm going to be looking at House of Wax, the 1953 Vincent Price remake. In this movie, wax is used to kill people and preserve their corpses. Before we start waxing nostalgic, let's briefly go over a few notable things about this film. House of Wax was the first color 3D film released by a mainstream American studio and the first to feature stereophonic sound. Theater gimmicks like this were somewhat common in the 50s, everything from swinging skeletons over the audience to vibrating seats. Ooh. It's not the first film to have success with 3D, however. Warner Brothers, who distributed House of Wax, saw the potential of this gimmick and contracted the creators of the Natural Vision 3D system, which was previously used in an independent film called Buona Devil. Critically, it flopped, but audiences were very amused by the 3D elements, and using them became pretty popular between 1952 and 1954. It's also important to note that this movie is, as mentioned previously, a remake. Because there was a subpar House of Wax movie in 2005, people sometimes assume that this one, with Vincent Price, is the original, but it is also a remake of The Mystery of the Wax Museum, which was based on a short story called The Waxworks by Charles S. Belden. It stars the delightfully sinister Vincent Price, who wasn't landing many roles before this. In fact, this movie kind of refreshed his career and put him on the horror movie fast track. I can honestly watch Price in anything. His spooky charisma is all I need to have a fun movie night, maybe accompanied by a molten lava cake. The cast comprises of relatively known actors and actresses, though I was most surprised to discover that it co-stars Carolyn Jones, who you may not recognize right away in this costume, but she played goth icon Morticia Adams in the Adams Family television series. Also, random Charles Bronson. He was credited under a different name during that time. Now, let's dive into this film. Just try to relax. It's the House of Wax. Professor Henry Jared, played by Price, is a skilled artist who owns his own wax museum in early 1900s New York. His specialty is sculpting realistic looking wax figures, and you know he's a true artist because look at that beard and stash. You know that man uses the wax to shape that thing. He has a fondness for creating historical figures, but nothing too macabre. I'd put in a chamber of horrors. Murder, torture, execution, scare the living daylights out of people. I don't care for that kind of patronage. Which is interesting, because many of the people he recreated had very grisly endings to their lives, but he, like, catches them right before that. Like, literally right before. But yes, he prefers his more vanilla take on the figures and has a special affection for his Marie Antoinette sculpture. His business partner, Matthew Burke, tries to encourage Jared to create more gruesome pieces and sets, something akin to Madame Tussaud's Chamber of Horrors, so they can attract more people. But Jared declines because he believes a well-known art critic named Sidney Wallace might buy him out. My friend Sidney Wallace, Professor Jared. It's a great pleasure. For me also, Professor. <laughs> That's a title that was bestowed on me when I became an exhibitor. It has little to do with my real work. <laughs> Wow, when Wallace entered the shot, I thought he was also Vincent Price. That would make a great sitcom, by the way. Two Vincents for the price of one. <laughs> I crack myself up. Wallace is impressed with the museum and does make an offer, but he will not be able to complete the purchase until after an upcoming trip. Despite that, Burke fears that Wallace might back out on the deal, and as a surefire thing, he tries to convince Jared to burn down the museum to collect the insurance money. <laughs> surefire thing. I get it. These dummies are insured for $25,000. That's $12,500 for each of us. You wouldn't need Wallace. You'd have enough to begin again. No, I'd rather die myself than see my friends destroyed. Ah, yes, your friends. That definitely sounds rational and not maladjusted. Jared does not agree with Burke's plans, but Burke's like, fuck it, and sets it ablaze anyway. This scene is by far the scariest in the movie for me. As an artist myself, it's horrific to see this artwork get destroyed in seconds. I would be traumatized if somebody torched all of my paintings. I don't consider them my friends or anything, but I'd rather them not be ruined. And though the movie isn't graphic or gruesome in any way, seeing the wax melt and slaw off the faces of these wax people is fairly explicit, and I felt so terrible for Jared. Even though you know these figures are inanimate, the fact that they resemble real people and it looks like they're burning alive makes this scene fairly disturbing. 
It's sad and chaotic, and the scene is shot well. It looks convincing. Probably because the fire was real, everything is being destroyed. At one point during this scene, the crew lost control of the fire, and it burnt a hole in the roof and singed Price's eyebrows, so this look of horror might be genuine. Burke fights with Jared before dousing him in kerosene and fleeing. Unable to stop the fire from spreading, we see Jared also attempting to escape before the entire building collapses. Eventually, the old-timey firefighters arrive. Welp, they're not gonna be able to do dick. Burke assumes Jared died in the fire, and is next seen trying to woo a young woman named Kathy, who is overtly interested in the insurance money he collected. After she suggests they go to Niagara Falls with a marriage license, Burke is like, oh shit no, check please, and heads back to his apartment to greedily count his newfound riches. However, he is not alone, as a disfigured man had been waiting for him. He cuts the lights and strangles him, dragging him out into the hall. Wow, this man is amazing at standing upright while dead. Incredible balance for a corpse, very impressive. He ties a phone cord around his neck and throws him down the elevator shaft. Brutal. Now, I assumed right away that this figure was Jared, considering his severely deformed face and because he had a solid motive. You fuck with my art, I fuck with your life. Meanwhile, Kathy is discussing her new sugar daddy to her friend, Sue. As my late friend Maddie used to say, if a girl don't watch her figure, the man won't. Maddie. Wasn't that the man you were going to marry? Yes, but he hung himself instead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Maddie was such a card. This woman is fucking weird. Also, interesting that they had her refer to a different hanging after Burke's. Is there a word for reverse foreshadowing or foreshadowing from the character's perspective? Backshadowing? She excuses herself, thinking she's gonna go visit Burke, and Sue also leaves for the evening to go job hunting. When she returns, she goes to Kathy's room to talk to her, but finds her dead in her bed. The cloaked figure is still in the room, and Sue escapes through the window. Oh shit, she just fell from the second story! Oh, she's okay. Somehow. She runs from the shadowy figure in a scene that looks like the Phantom of the Opera is pretending to be Jack the Ripper and manages to escape by getting into a friend's house nearby. She sobs and laments about what happened, and the next day they all go to the police. They inform her that Kathy's body was stolen from the morgue during that night and Matthew Burke's body had been stolen a few weeks ago. We actually do get to see the morgue. A couple workers seem to be finishing their shift when one of the bodies just sits upright for no reason and one guy is like, hey, what's up with this one? As if it's normal, not scared at all. And the other mortician says, eh, because of the embalming chemicals, corpses just do that sometimes. It's not just a little wiggle though, he just springs right up. That's not okay. In another part of town, we see that Jared has miraculously survived the museum fire, with only his hands sustaining injury, making the audience wonder. Oh heck, who the crud is this guy then? The art critic, Sidney Wallace, visits him at his new studio, and Jared tells him that he will be opening a new wax museum, and this time he will give the people what they want. More sensational, thrilling figures based on historical acts of violence, though he cannot use his hands, so he relies on his pupils to help him out. I'm going to give the people what they want. Sensation, horror, shock. Send them out in the streets to tell their friends how wonderful it is to be scared to death. He then takes him to his weird wax dipping horror dungeon, where he shows Wallace how sculpted mannequins are coated. It looks like a science experiment using Pepto-Bismol. Or maybe that weird amoxicillin crap I used to take for ear infections. Ugh. He also shows Wallace the wax figure of Matthew Burke. Jared said he created him from memory, and then he just... Let's it fall on the floor. It's a remarkable likeness, but it can't be a death mask. No, it's from memory. That was a very weird way to segue a scene. We get an intermission, which seems strange in a film I'm just watching on the internet, but this was implemented because it was shown using a double projection system and required a real change. The museum is now open and we're greeted by a theater barker who seems to be annoying people with some paddle balls. The women are initially amused, but it quickly turns to irritation. Ah, uh, here's three lovely little ladies right over here. Ugh, get your balls out of my face. This paddle ball was meant to be a part of the 3D gimmick. In fact, the barker blatantly addresses the audience at one point. Well, there's someone with a bag of popcorn. Close your mouth, it's the bag I'm aiming at. Not your tonsils. Here she comes. Now, I think this museum is amazing. I love scary wax figures and dabble in the macabre, not to be confused with dabbing on the macabre, but the museum guests don't seem to have the same appreciation that I do. Oh, Millie! Price really shines as Jared in this segment. I love his descriptions of the scenes he's showcasing, and like most murderous lunatics, he's very captivating and has this kind of morbid charm. So successful was this machine at cutting off the heads of the French aristocrats, they named it after its creator. And here it is, the bloody guillotine. 
Sue attends the museum opening and is shocked to see a Joan of Arc figure that resembles Kathy. She's shaken by the similarities and has to take a moment. Jared overhears her and assures her that he saw Kathy's photo in the paper and used them as inspiration for the figure. Which is very weird, but he somehow is able to charm Sue into thinking that it's flattering and not weird, and also convinces Sue that she could be the inspiration for his beloved Marie Antoinette sculpture. You mean I look like she did? Exactly as she did. Once in his lifetime, every artist feels the hand of God and creates something that comes alive. So it was with my Marie Antoinette and I loved her. Once again, morbid charm. Later that night, the cloaked man breaks into Sue's room through a window, presumably to kill her and take the body, but she wakes up and screams, scaring him away. Despite her fears, she's able to move on somewhat and even get back into the dating scene. This can-can dance is meant to be another 3D gimmick because who doesn't want to feel like they're being kicked in the face? Sue, however, is not impressed. I don't know. It doesn't seem proper. All those girls showing the... the talents. <gasps> Those bare shoulders, so improper. Scott. Hmm? Look at her butt. Now completely convinced that there is something up with the Joan of Arc figure, Sue decides to go to the museum to investigate. She runs into Jared, who catches her examining the sculpture. He forgives her for messing with it and presents her with... Her head. Seriously, that is unnerving. The police also launched their own investigation after realizing that John Wilkes Booth suspiciously looks like a deputy attorney that had disappeared, and after briefly questioning Jared's assistant, Leon Averill, they believe that something isn't right. They realize that Averill, who does wax work for the museum, is actually Carl Hendricks, who had been on their wanted list for breaking his parole after a brief stint in prison. They find the watch of the missing deputy attorney in Averill's possession and begin an interrogation. Sue decides to take matters into her own hands and visits the museum after hours, also looking for her love interest, Scott, who had been apprenticing there. Upon entering, Jared's assistant, Igor, locks her in. Suddenly, Igor. This entire scene is very tense, even with Igor's head comically placed like a wax head on the shelf. His face does have a molded look to it. There's a reason video games and movies use things like mannequins, and it's because they are fucking scary. Anything we perceive as human or having human features, whether alive or not, is intriguing to us, and the unnaturally realistic yet static nature of things like statues can be especially terrifying, even more so when you're alone in a room with them in the dark. She approaches Joan of Arc one more time to reveal what she had suspected all along. People! The Chamber of Horrors is creepy! Jared finds her and proves himself capable of walking, having pretended to be bound to a wheelchair this entire time, and corners her. Sue tries to fight him off but manages to instead break apart a wax mask he was using to conceal his identity. Surprise, he's the killer. This looks fantastic. It happens so fast that you don't notice that it's a practical effect and doesn't quite match Price's face, but I was impressed at how well it worked. It's not the most surprising twist because I kept wondering if he really was just wearing a mask. There would be no way only his hands were injured in that fire, but it's still a pretty cool reveal. Shocked by this, Sue faints and she is taken, stripped naked, and put in a coffin to be doused in boiling wax. Averill finally cracks under the pressure and admits that Jared had been using real people to create his wax figures. Joan of Arc, that's Kathy. She's there with all the rest of them. That whole place is a morgue. He'll do the same with Sue Allen if he ever gets his hands on her. So the police bolt to the museum, and good guy Scott also heads back there and gets into a scuffle with Igor, who shoves his head into the guillotine. That's really not going to be good for PR. The police finally arrive on the scene, first saving Scott from decapitation, then heading to the cellar to save Sue. The majority of this film really relies on suspense, but the final 15 minutes or so are more action-packed and thrilling. It's very satisfying to see the pace accelerate as Jared fights off the policemen, all while the wax continues to boil. Jared gets punched in the face and careens into the vat, causing a Pepto-Bismol explosion. Ooh, yeah. Sue is saved, and we get the most abrupt, tonally odd ending where everyone has a little chuckle about it. Well, you almost lost your head, Miss Allen. Would you care to keep that one as a spare? Yes, thank you. <laughs> you know, Shane, by the time this guy gets out of Sing Sing, this head will grow a long beard. <laughs> This movie did not do well critically when it was first released. Reviews were pretty much mixed with more negatives than positives, possibly because the 3D aspects were considered a bit contrived and some critics were not impressed by the story, but it has aged well among horror fans and is considered a cult classic. I really enjoyed the film. If you've seen the 2005 slasher remake, 
and I say the word remake very loosely here, then you might have some preconceived notions about it. House of Wax 2005 has an emphasis on shock and violence, it's more on the gory side as you can expect from a slasher movie, but this version is gore free and more eerie than frenetic, I would put it in the category of suspense horror. And that really works for me, I love it. The most explicit scene is the one I earlier discussed with the sculptures melting, otherwise it plays out like a murder mystery in a way. Price's acting is wonderful, he is believably weird and a little twisted, and I adore Price no matter what, but he can be cheesy, as you can imagine. Last year I reviewed House on Haunted Hill, a favorite of mine, and I found that movie more on the corny side, whereas House of Wax felt more serious, more realistic, and I love that the fear comes from the idea that maybe these wax figures are corpses, not because I'm actually seeing people being murdered or covered in wax. It's not perfect, as the parts that were supposed to look cool in 3D felt out of place when I just watched it on the internet, but if you're looking for an addition to your classic horror collection or just want something to watch on Halloween, then I do recommend it. Light some candles, order a pizza, down some Pepto-Bismol, and have a chilling time with House of Wax. Wax. Hey everyone, thank you for watching my video on House of Wax. I hope you give it a watch. If you want to see other movie reviews, I have some linked in my annotations, and if you want to regale me with spooky tales, check out my social media. You can also give me money via Patreon if you find you just have way too much of it. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.